Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the sociology of Surat. Surat stands for the Society for Research on Rapport and Telekinesis. It represents one of the most controversial case studies in the field of parapsychology or psychical research. My guest is Dr. James McLennan, a professor of sociology as well as a clinical social worker. He is the author of Deviant Science, The Case of Parapsychology. His other books include Wondrous Events, Foundations of Religious Belief, Wondrous Healing, Shamanism, Human Evolution, and the Origin of Religion, and also the Entity Letters, a sociologist on the trail of a supernatural mystery. This interview was conducted using Skype, so now I will switch over to the Skype video. Welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I know your work on the Surratt Group uh, is fascinating. You approach it as a sociologist, which is important because it's probably one of the very most controversial cases in the entire history of parapsychology and psychical research. Well, and then the, the history of it's very interesting. Uh, the, the founder of Surratt was John G. Nyhart. And he was a very famous poet during his day uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, and a, a famous author in the 1960s. He, he hung out with the Ogala Sioux and the medicine man Black Elk and wrote the book Black Elk Speaks, which was a bestseller during the 1960s, 1970s. So in the uh, 1961, he was a a professor at the University of Missouri in Columbia, and he organized a group of college students to try to investigate spiritualist phenomena and psychic phenomena. And the idea was they would do table tipping experiments. So they gathered around the table, they put their hands on the table, and in uh, maybe the very end of September 1961, they started doing this every week. And by December, they started getting rapping sounds. And by January, the table started moving around. And not long afterwards, the table would levitate and people would go into trance and they felt they were communicating with spirits. And my heart was very scientifically oriented. He was a friend of J.B. Ryan at Duke University. And so he wanted to preclude the possibility of fraud. So he assigned various other students to be observers and they were armed with flashlights and they tried to figure out where the raps came from and they tried to figure out how the table was staying up in the air and there's a question in their minds was this uh, perhaps some kind of mutual hallucination so he armed students with cameras and they took photographs of the table up in the air and sure enough uh, there it was, no one touching it up in the air, uh, stable. And uh, this... Now, excuse me, yeah. th this is the sort of phenomenon that Nyhart, I understand, experienced earlier uh, on the Ogallala Sioux Reservation, uh, a practice that he had witnessed amongst the Native Americans. Yeah, the, the Native Americans, would, the medicine man would go inside a tent and they would all gather around and the sides of the tent would shake and answer questions. They could ask questions of the tent. And it would, it seemed to be a paranormal phenomenon and voices from spirits would come and then they could communicate with the spirits. And they also did rain dances and various rituals. And it, it was, it was a kind of a common practice. And Nyhart was in tune with it. They, they accepted, they accepted him as a, a kind of medicine man himself. He had had out of body experiences and, and, so 
when he achieved this phenomenon in 1962, uh, he determined that the spirit coming through was Black Elk, his old friend. So uh, this made sense to him. But but there was a, a question in a lot of people's minds, and there was a lot of uh, controversy. The community in Missouri was disturbed, and the, the college officials started investigating, and they they took away some of the participants' scholarships, and that one woman, her visa was rejected, and another woman, her parents uh, got her committed and held for observation in a mental hospital. So my heart realized it had to be more covert and about the phenomena. So that, that, that from the very beginning, they got very, very robust results, but very intense uh, negative reactions. Mm-hmm. Now, And he called the group Surat. Can you explain the name? Well, it's a Society for Research and Rapport and Telekinesis. Mm-hmm. And this is the name that the students came up with. And the idea was to develop rapport within the group, and that was his hypothesis that that was the source of the phenomena. That's what made the phenomena happen. And the, the students developed a very intense rapport with each other and, and maintained that community, really, many of them for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. They, they continued meeting. So uh, uh, Nyhart's graduate student, uh, John Thomas Richards, Tom Richards, uh, was assigned the task of a note taker. And so he started taking notes, uh, but then he he left Columbia and took his first uh, job assignment in Cape Girard, Missouri. And actually, actually, he went to Snowflake, Arizona for about three years. And so when he came back, then Nyhart decided to reconstitute the group and they met together more covertly with a smaller number of people. Some of the, some of the early sessions had been attended by over 50 people or something in that neighborhood. Mm. And that, that seemed to stimulate too much controversy. So uh, in that later group, a few years later, they, they met for a number of months. And then the same phenomena started happening. Very, very robust phenomena. And... Uh, Nyhart contacted J.B. Ryan and said, kind of ask for advice. What, what should we do? How can we, how can we preclude the possibility of fraud? And Ryan suggested perhaps doing some type of ESP experiment, which he himself was doing, or constructing sealed containers uh, within which the phenomena could create effects and then they would verify or preclude the possibility of fraud. So some of the Surats started doing that. They built containers, and sure enough, they got effects. And the phenomena uh, started leaving written messages inside the sealed containers, Mm. uh, some of which is uninterpretable, like rune writing or something like that. And uh, everyone was kind of blown away. They weren't really sure what to do about this or how how to engage in this or what it all meant. And my heart was open to any type of idea. He he did he himself felt he was communicating with black elk, but other spirits were coming through and there was writing all kinds of strange things. Uh, so in 1969, J.B. Ryan sent William Edward Cox, Ed Cox, who who was one of his colleagues there in Durham, North Carolina, and Cox started coming out and uh, trying to test the spirits' extrasensory perception. And uh, his originally that was pretty successful. It seemed that they had ESP, but they weren't willing to cooperate with the experiments. They would uh, tell him that it wasn't really that important. That, that there were other things much more important. Mm. And uh, he 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 observed some of the levitations, but that he was very familiar with spiritualist era lore and the possibility of fraud. And he didn't see whether, that there's really a way of precluding the possibility of fraud. So he attempted creating his own sealed experiments, and that seemed to furnish no obstacle for the spirits. They Things could move in and out, and the writing continued, and uh, uh, they were trying to explain the meaning of life or something like that. And Cox had a kind of an abrasive personality, and the, the, the Surratt group, some of them were somewhat offended by him. He 
he refused to use the word spirits. He referred to them as the agency or the entities or something like that because he felt that the the, the uh, facts supporting belief in life after death weren't adequate mm. and we should suspend our judgment in that area. And so that irked some of the participants. But he only visited, you know, sporadically. And so it wasn't until uh, later... Let's see, I have to try and look at my notes to get the exact year. 1970s. Mm. He, he retired, let's see, he retired and moved to Durham. And then that was the beginning of a major investigation on his part. I think it would be 1979. You, you mean he moved to Rolla, Missouri? He moved to Rolla, Missouri. Missouri, yes. yeah. Nyhart, okay, Nyhart died, and John Thomas Richards and other Surratts continued the experiments. They had found that they didn't really need Nyhart to be present. Now, Nyhart was a very careful investigator, and, and he followed some interesting lines of research. He, was, he wanted to figure out whether it was telepathy or whether it was coming from their minds or the source of the phenomena. And the, the spirits could do astonishing things. Like he would ask for a particular book to be brought to him, and it would fly off the bookcase and come flying through the air and land in front of him, you know, and so then he tried writing down the name of a book and they would, they would try to do something like that. But as he tightened up his experimental procedure, they were less cooperative. So uh, it, it would seem like they didn't, they couldn't really preclude the possibility of fraud, but you would have to accuse a number of participants of doing this. It would have to be some kind of cooperative effort. And Nyhart would be central towards this, Thing, except that they could get results without him being present. Mm -hmm. And John Thomas Richards and his friend Joe and some of the other participants all conducted experiments on their own. So when Nyhart died in 1973, the experiments continued and Richards kept taking notes. And when Ed Cox moved to Rolla, Missouri, he decided that Tom Richards would be the, his main contact person. Richards is the only one who was who was totally open to psychical research and scientific investigation. Other people were more interested in spiritual sciences and things like that. Richards, uh, as I recall, was a professor himself. Yes. He got his English degree from the University of Missouri, and then he started teaching. He moved down to Cape Girard, Missouri, for a number of years and organized groups down there. And they got very, very astonishing results down there. Table levitations table movements, rapping sounds, the whole room would shake like it was an earthquake, uh, poltergeist effects, uh, people seeing apparitions, very, very active phenomena in many, many different people's houses. And those people are still available. Some of them are still alive. So when I entered the case in 1981, I sent out a questionnaire, and many of them in Cape Girard and in Colombia and in other places responded and told me all these strange stories of what had gone on and showed me pictures, photographs of levitating tables, mm -hmm. which which are available to us. We can look at the yeah. pictures and we can look at all these, everyone who was involved, uh, a large percentage of them are open for interviews. Now, I understand uh, that you were initially, and, and perhaps even to this day, very skeptical and uncomfortable with all of this uh, phenomena. Well, I was a sociologist, and uh, and I had I had traveled around the country and interviewed parapsychologists, and the parapsychologists were skeptical. Uh, parapsychology has an inherent skepticism kind of built into it that. Uh, Psychical researchers are used to investigating phenomena and finding incidences of fraud. And so in 1981, I was a young man. And I was, had to interview. And I, I also had investigated various haunting cases. And it, it's difficult to preclude the possibility of fraud. And so I thought that it would enhance my career if I went out to Missouri and, and uh, kind of under the tutelage of Ed Cox, I, I could observe the phenomena and it, it most people were convinced it was fraudulent because it was so robust. It was so unbelievable. And, and part of the problem was Cox himself. He, he constructed sealed containers and the phenomena could move objects in and out through the, the, the 
containers. So he conducted a glass aquarium-like container, inverted aquarium, and put micro switches in the floor of it so that if anything moved inside, it would switch on a camera, uh, a movie camera. And that docu- that created hours of films, uh, maybe a little over an hour after it was all edited down, of films of objects moving in and out of the mini lab, moving around inside, flames bursting in spontaneously in the mini lab, uh, pinwheels moving around as if some wind is blowing, but objects waving around out of sync with the wind, and uh, things which would be difficult to do fraudulently, but possible. It's hard to it's hard to conceive how it could be done, but that possibility existed, and the parapsychologists were very very skeptical. So I thought I would go out there in 1981 and and catch the cheaters, and then that would enhance my reputation as a, as a field researcher. Uh, but it was, uh, and that was the disturbing part. I went out there, and from the very beginning, the spirits were very friendly. They wrote messages to me, and Cox himself was kind of like a savant or something. He was very, very meticulous in his strategies for detecting fraud. He uh, would put secret hairs on the mini lab close to any kind of lock so that if you touched anything inside or outside, then it would disturb it and he would be able to detect that. And uh, I don't think the parapsychology community was aware of the, the degree of, of effort that he was putting into this case. This was his whole life work and he was spending all his time doing this. Yeah. And so I came in there and he showed me all these procedures he was going through and then the next night, Sure enough, a paper flew it had somehow gotten into the mini lab and it wrote on it, hi, Jim. And uh, that was my beginning of interaction with these spirits who were very personable. They, you, could, the, you could communicate with the raps. They had a, a kind of alphabetical way of responding. Like one rap would be yes, two raps is no, three raps is maybe. Then an alphabet, one rap is A, two raps is B. Three reps of C, four or D, and so you could ask a question, you know. And I, I think I, when I first met them, I said hi, and they rap back. H, I like that. Hi, back, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could communicate with them. And you tape recorded these raps. Oh yeah, and the Surratt's tape recorded them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Surratt's. Took, uh, Richards took meticulous notes of all the phenomena, and that was the other thing I encountered when I first arrived. All these people showed me their scrapbooks, and they had taken photographs of levitating tables and objects moving around, other levitating objects, and described events on almost lights in the sky that they had seen, the room shaking like an earthquake, and they wanted me to go out to Skyrim, my heart's old home and see the phenomena more robust and up close. And it seemed to me like if I did that, I would ruin my career as a sociologist. Uh, But I kind of got roped in by the social situation. And as I was trying to get away from the Richards with the idea of never coming back, John G. Narhart started rapping to me and invited me to Skyrim. And I I agreed. And so I felt kind of obligated. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, because he was a famous guy, you know, important poet and author. And uh, Richards loaned me all these audio tapes, and I listened to session after session after session, people communicating with raps, spirits giving messages, uh, very sincere sounding people, very sane, logical sounding people. Uh, so I went out to Skyrim, and sure enough, the table jumps around, the raps sound no, the raps don't just sound out of the floor in one place. There was there was a there's probably over fifteen people there, and and there were three different conversations with three different spirits going on simultaneously. People were talking to three different sets of raps, which were coming in three different places in the room, mm-hmm. and the whole room shook like an earthquake. And you could, it it seemed to me that I could feel these waves of rapport sweeping through the room. It, it was like a religious experience, and. I don't know. I don't know how 
what percentage of your listeners are familiar with sociological theory, but the, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim argued that religion has this foundation in group interaction and people have a sensation of the group and that, that creates a religious sentiment according to his theory. Mm-hmm. But I thought that evening, you know, I, you know, I was thinking, I wish Durkheim had been with me because I can feel this phenomena and it's, this isn't something, this doesn't feel like something that people are just mistakenly uh, feeling. This is a real sensation that's, that seemed like it was sweeping through the group in harmony with the, with these earthquake waves. And I put a lot of effort. I watched people's knees. I thought certainly something, someone's jumping up and down. But you couldn't see it, you know. And so after a while, I said, well, maybe I should just sit back and watch. And it was a very emotional event. And but I, I didn't know, I can didn't really ima- know how to, to, to deal with it. I can imagine you're caught in a conflict because on the one hand, rapport seems critical to this group. That's part of their name. And on the other hand, you you went there with the idea of exposing fraud. Yes. Uh, and I had put a lot of effort into that. I had, I had talked to James Randi. I had been to spiritualist meetings. Uh, I had taken courses in spiritualism. And, uh, you know, there's... People act very sincere. Uh, They would begin with the Lord's Prayer, sing hymns, and then do things which Randy could explain and other magicians could explain. So I felt that I was knowledgeable in that area and thought that it was pretty likely I would be able to detect fraud. But it just wasn't the case. Now, at the same time, okay, here's the rub. The same time that I could not detect fraud, I could not induce an experience which I which I was certain was authentic hmm. the phenomena had a hiding quality and the Surats themselves seemed to be aware of that they showed me they, they were keeping all these photographs now some of the photographs showed people with their their fingers underneath the table edge as if they were holding up the table and I asked about that and they said well that happens you know and uh, when the table comes up in the air then there's a tendency for it to look like your fingers are underneath it and the spirits that they seem to have control over the situation so that the photographs oftentimes have the appearance of fraud. Mm -hmm. And that sounds kind of suspicious. And so when I'm with them, I would say, oh, wow, this is, I'm in this like Alice in Wonderland world. When I'm back home, I think, what, what have I fallen into? This can't be true. There's got to be some kind of explanation, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure what that explanation is. Well, I think at this point, it's useful to note that there were other groups of people, independent of Surat, who were producing similar phenomena, particularly the work of Bacheldor in England. Yes, Bacheldor in England, and also the Philip group up in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, they had gathered together. Now, they're, they wanted to to demonstrate both had a kind of secular orientation. They weren't, they weren't so interested in spirits. Uh, Bachelador had the theory that you put people put their hands on the table, then it moves around by subconscious muscular movements and that induces belief. And then that the level of belief gets strong enough so that the authentic phenomena can occur. Okay. The Philip group wanted to demonstrate that you didn't actually need authentic spirits, that the group itself meeting regularly and discussing a fictitious story of Philip, this guy who had committed suicide in the 1600s when his mistress had been burnt as a stake at the witch, as a witch, and he had not spoken up. So he had motivation to be a spirit, and uh, they were able to produce the phenomena. So, but these these groups met; they, they were later historically than the Surat group. The Surat, mm-hmm. The Surat group preceded everyone, and my heart, when he began, wasn't really, he didn't really know what the results would be. So these were, we're kind of making it up as we go along. We're kind of finding out what happens if you are open to the idea of spirits, but but willing to accept the phenomena the way it's going to be coming out. So that's what we're dealing with in 19, early 1980s. Now, uh, Ed Cox 
had all these films. He presented them at meetings of the Parapsychological Association, and they laughed at him. They, there's a, just the levels of skepticism were very, very intense, and they wouldn't. They were unwilling to allow him to publish his results, and uh, there were other events which were similarly uh, invited skepticism, like the Foundation for the Research in Nature of Man in Durham did an ESP card experiment and someone had tampered with the deck and sliced it open and that someone was probably apparently the spirits themselves. They left a message inside, you know, in their in their handwriting. Uh, now, so, let me stop for a second. You're talking yeah. about a, a, a research project initiated at uh, what is popularly called FRNM, FRNM, Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man, huh? to test the ability of uh, the ESP ability of the entities or yes. members yeah. of the Surat group. So they they sent them yes. a, a sealed deck of cards. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And that sealed deck then was then sent off to other places, you know, yeah. with the hopes that somebody else would somehow do complete it. And uh, if, if I sure remember you. your book correctly, the idea was to see if they could reshuffle the cards inside the sealed deck without breaking the seal. Yes, that was one of the tasks that they were. They, actually, Furnham did a number of experiments and, and I started doing experiments. Yes, uh, some was to get information inside sealed decks and, or to reshuffle the sealed deck. Uh, but in every case, the experiment came to naught, and, and one particular incident it looked pretty much like someone had slid open the envelope and pretty heavy-handedly engaged in some kind of fraud. Hmm. And uh, that someone seemed to be uh, either the spirits themselves or Tom Richards or someone other person mm -hmm. inside the Surratt group. And this all happened in 1983. Then there's another... They invited some outside amateur psychical researchers, and they had a, a negative experience. They they seemed to think they saw Tom uh, uh, jumping up and down and making the earth take quake its effect, and other fraudulent behavioral people lifting tables. And so there was a lot of negative phenomena in 1983, and that ended the, the professional parapsychologist uh, interaction with this group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but did you you stayed involved, I presume? Well, uh, yes, in 1981 and 82, I had seen the spirits write these messages, and it, it seemed to me then in 1982 I went to I, I got a teaching job in Asia with the University of Maryland, and I had a chance to interview a lot of shamanic practitioners practitioners all over Asia, and. It seemed to me like Surat was very much like a shamanic group. You have a, a people in the community assembling, you have the shaman, the shaman creating a kind of performance in trance, and then ostensible paranormal phenomena occurring, but under uncontrolled conditions. And so I felt that Surat was a, kind of like a kind of shamanism. And, and a lot of times it, within shamanism, there's an ideology and the the spirits advocate the ideology, and that provides benefits for community members. So I thought it would be interesting to allow the spirits to write since they like to write. So I left paper and pencil out for them, and they could write messages. And there were a lot of messages. Hmm. In fact, they were very, very prolific. Inside the, some, they sorted out inside the sealed mini lab, but that was no problem for them. They could make things move in and out of the mini lab without any difficulty. So they would send me letters through the mail and I'd write letters back to them and Tom Richards would put them by the mini lab and then they'd write letters back and other Surat members started doing the same thing. And this became a very, very robust phenomena, absurd, absurdly robust. In other words, there, there didn't seem to be any difficulty for them to write letters. And so when I was in Asia, I wrote them letters. And when I returned, I continued writing them. And so about a dozen other people were doing the same thing. And they expressed their philosophy and the meaning of life and uh, the nature of the uh, physical world and all kinds of philosophical questions. And uh, it was they're kind of like cosmic pen pals. And you, I presume you still have these letters. Well, uh, that, that's a strange story. The, 
This phenomenon goes on for decade after decade, and the parapsychologist here is totally uninterested. And I conducted, I, I spent a lot of effort into trying to authenticate the phenomena, and they, they couldn't pass any tests. Mm. Okay, And the letters were, it had, they have absurd qualities, like they're supposedly from deceased people, but the spirits could never prove themselves. Like, for example, say you're talking to your grandmother in a seance, you could ask her, Grandma, what's your social security number? Uh, do you think that you would get the correct number? No. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so if you once you start, yeah, once you start in, investigating, uh, you don't get good results. And, mm -hmm. and that was the case again and again. And I tried ex extrasensory perception experiments and they couldn't really pass them. And. The letters were just piling up. I probably had uh, 10 boxes of letters, you know, huge, large boxes. And uh, sometimes they, the, the volume was so high, it, the, the thought that Tom Richard, oh, then the other element of the letter writing was that a lot of times the misspellings inside the letters were the same as the kind of misspellings that Tom Richards uh, it was prone to. And the grammatical forms were the same as his. And he had he had absolutely no awareness of writing them. It was clear to me he was totally unaware of writing them. And in fact, sometimes they were written and disappeared when he wasn't even at home. So this thing is just very bizarre. And I, I couldn't attract attention to parapsychologists. And uh, I could I wrote a manuscript about the case. Okay, mm -hmm. I couldn't get a publisher of the manuscript. Yeah, and this, and my career as, as a sociologist was floundering. I'd written I'd written a book about the deviant science of parapsychology, and that had put, kind of stigmatized me. I wrote a book about shamanism, and that was the same thing. And so I wasn't, you know, I didn't know really where to go. Oh, then in nineteen. 86, it seemed like the phenomena was declining. The I never saw any levitations. The, the table would get up in the air, and I, I, I videotaped some very unusual phenomena, but not full levitations. It, it seemed like in the 1980s, end of 1980s, there weren't raps coming directly out of the floor. It seemed like uh, that Richard's to my mind, probably was in doing something. He, he wasn't aware of it, but that would be a logical way of thinking mm -hmm. about the case. And so I, I continued interaction. I went out there again and again. I, I don't know how many times I went out there. Every, every year, every few years, I went out there. And it's just a social event. I, I stopped taking notes as a sociologist because he, he, would, he would ask me to investigate things. He would ask me to interview people because he felt that this would be very evidential, and they would accuse him of fraud. Rich, you're talking about Richards. Richards, yeah, yeah, Tom Richards would. Yeah. He would set up an interview, at, you know, and then I'd investigate the person, and they would accuse him of fraud. They, they'd tell me that they were certain the phenomena was authentic, and yet he had tried to simulate a poltergeist event, you know, and, and I, oh, I would ask him about it, and he would deny everything, his wife would deny everything, and the, the ambiguity was a extremely intense mm -hmm. it was impossible that the phenomena was all authentic it was impossible that the phenomena was not authentic but no one was i had no one really to talk with except some of the other surat members like john hunt i used to talk to on the telephone and uh, and meet out in missouri periodically and Vern Motter. Mm -hmm. and you know some of these people are still alive john hunt and Vern are still alive steve calvin he's deceased Tom Richards died two years ago. You know, mm -hmm. uh, his wife is still alive, uh, but it, but it, I, there was no one in my home I could discuss this with. I found that if I talked about it, people found it absurd. It was and yeah. it was absurd. The phenomena had a had a had a very very absurd quality to it. I I don't know whether I should even describe some of the things. I I got one parapsychologist to go out there, but the woman was just totally freaked out. Everything she saw could have occurred through fraud, you see. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I suspect she assumed that it must have. Mm -hmm. And she wanted no part of it. You know, like, 
She wanted no more contact. Well, I, in a way, Jim, it's too bad that you and I weren't in closer contact in those years because yeah. at the same time, I was researching the macro psychokinetic phenomenon of Ted Owens and experience uh, a very similar social response as a result. Yes, and that, that research of yours is very, very interesting. Uh, uh, very many parallel features, yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is a very strange case that happened in Los Angeles with Raymond Bayless, his wife, Tom Richards, and Elaine Richards, Tom's wife. Okay, Tom, he was a professor at Cape Girard, and he was trying to get scientists to investigate the phenomena, but none were coming. None were coming to Cape Girard. Uh, you know, Ed Cox visited him sporadically. So he, Ed Cox set it up so he drove out to Los Angeles so that he might be investigated by Raymond Bayless, okay? So Bayless set up a situation where there's absolute darkness and they all put their hands on the table and the table came up in the air, all right? And uh, after, now I have Richard's notes of this session. Because the cave, table came up in the air and apparently Richards took his hands off the table, he felt that it had levitated. That was his definition of a success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he felt it had levitated. Okay, now, now in Bayless's opinion, Bayless had lifted the table on his side. Then when he took his hands off the tail, air, the table remained in the air. So he felt this remained, this proved that Bayless, that Tom was holding the table up in the air. Hmm. Okay. I think that was what his, that would be his interpretation because he was skeptical. So we, we have no idea. Okay, now, so the possibility exists that Tom lifted the table in the air and didn't realize it, or Tom lifted the table in the air and he did realize it, or that Tom didn't lift the table. All those possibilities exist, and we haven't resolved the situation, but it depends on whether you're a skeptic or a believer as to the, the right uh, interpretation. Now, after the fact, Tom uh, Richards had written to Bachelor Door. Bachelor Door had described this idea to him, and Tom Richards felt that idea was a good idea. He felt that explained, helped explain the phenomena because the phenomena had intense ambiguity associated with it. It seemed impossible to prove it, and so Richards himself couldn't explain this. He, he wasn't clear why this was the case, and and this idea explained it. Mm -hmm. Bachelor's idea explained it. So he and Bachelor communicated uh, fairly frequently. Well, I communicate with Bachelor. I've never mentioned this to anybody, so I don't know what to make of this. And I mentioned the fact that there's a possibility that there's fraud. And Bachelor is horrified by the idea. He didn't want anything to do with fraud. Mm. And I, I thought, well, what's going on? Because that fits with his his, his theory. theory. Yeah. Well. You know, as I recall, uh, the description published uh, in your book by Scott Rogo, my distant cousin, he, he said Bayless was lifting the table deliberately. Yeah, to, yeah. And, and then uh, Bayless let go and the table dropped, but it dropped on the other end. The end that Bayless had been lifting remained in the air. Yeah, yes, that's right. That's what he said. Yeah. So his infer he inferred that Tom Richards must be holding up the table. Ah. Okay, so and we and we don't know, but you know my experience investigating shamanism. Now here's the other side of the coin. Okay, yeah, if a phenomenon occurs regularly, you can pretty much count on it having a normal explanation. Yeah, I mean, be real, <laughs> you know. Yeah, <laughs> be real. And, and I watched thousands of psychic surgeries in the Philippines, and they all looked like sleight of hand procedures. Mm -hmm. So. There's the other side of the coin. Being skepticism, being skeptical, is it's nothing wrong. I think being a pragmatic mystic and realizing mm -hmm. that, it, and and the idea of uh, the phenomena occurring with people in trance, it could be it's, there's there's a huge level of ambiguity, and that that seems to facilitate the strangeness occurring. So uh, let's just um, you know practice meditation or prayer or some spiritual exercise and uh, keep make put a positive you know be positive stay positive minded and, mm -hmm. and and developing rapport with the people around us you know 
In, in, in other words, authentic skepticism is an essential ingredient, uh, even in a mystical path. Yes, and totally necessary. I'm working on a theory right now that kind of explains that. I think our subconscious uh, shapes the phenomena, and we have skepticism in our subconscious. So I think that that stimulates this quirkiness, the trickster. Ah. I think that makes the trickster phenomena. I think it's a kind of dream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know you... Uh, worked with George Hansen, who wrote a book on the trickster and the paranormal. Yeah, he was he was very deeply involved with Surratt. And other people have similar experiences. Uh, uh, the, when the, a close scientific scrutiny of a case prevents it from occurring. A lot of poltergeist phenomena are like that. Mm. A close scrutiny. And the, the camera angles are such that the camera is unable to verify the authenticity of the phenomena in poltergeist cases. Mm -hmm. A lot of Australian cases are like that. Well, and of course, that gives the skeptics or the scoffers a a perfect argument. As soon as you tighten the conditions, the uh, phenomenon disappears. And yet Ed Cox claimed that his conditions were absolutely foolproof. Yes, but, you know, and so they devi- they decided to invite the McDonald lab in St. Louis. There's a, a laboratory for psychical research in those days. And they constructed a very, very uh, sophisticated mini lab. And it got very, very limited results. Mm-hmm. So they were unable to replicate Cox's experiment. And then uh, Cox himself had a kind of an abrasiveness to yeah. him. And it was difficult to be around him for long periods of time. And so Elaine Richards found it, you know, I, I've been, I've talked to her on the phone recently and we laughed about how it was, sometimes it was so irritating, but but he was, he was certainly sincere in, in the endeavor. You, you had to hand that to him. Mm-hmm. But, and, you know, his mini lab uh, was in the basement of Richards' home, which is a little different than at the laboratory in St. Louis, Missouri. Well, yes, when when he first constructed it, of course they they put it in uh, uh, this one guy's house because there were polar guys phenomena going on there. But there was a lot, a little bit of friction between the guy and the Surratts, so they, then they moved it to my friend John Hunt's house because he had a polar guys phenomena going on there and uh, then he got a job and so that it ended up in Richard's basement Richards didn't consider himself to be a medium but he was just willing to he, he was an advocate of scientific research because Nyhart had trained him mm-hmm. and he he admired Nyhart and he wanted to extend what Nyhart wanted to do so in a way he was kind of roped into this and in a way it's the same with me it was just my basic curiosity caused this long-term interaction. Now, the question, what happened to all these mini letters? Now, Richards we, R- Richards has a copy of everything that I have, and that's it's in the basement of his house right now, today. Mm-hmm. I've thrown away, I threw away all the letters because I formed the opinion that the research was uh, preventing the phenomena from occurring, mm. and close scrutiny was preventing it from occurring. And so, and it seemed to me that spiritual healing and mental health was the the direction that this was leading. That's what Black Elk advised me. That was the direction that Black Elk advised me to go with this phenomena. And so I went back to graduate school and got a uh, a master's degree in social work and uh, worked in a psychiatric hospital for wow. a number of years. And that's what really educated me mm-hmm. with regard to the power of of belief and and. Uh, the value of kind of giving up yourself and thinking on spirit on a spiritual level mm-hmm. rather than a completely scientific level. Mm-hmm. In in other words, you're, what you're suggesting is that the the scientific attitude, uh, especially with regard to paranormal phenomenon, and even mostly especially with regard to macro psychokinesis, uh, interferes with the. Uh, conducive state required to produce the phenomena. Well, it would seem so because skepticism is an inherent norm of science. And I, and I think a lot of my behaviors in investigating Surratt reduce the phenomena. Mm-hmm. And, 
uh, I think I'm, I'm now working on an analysis of Tom Richards' notes, and certain people have a high level of success, and other people had a lower level of ex- success, and I had a lower level of ex- success. I, I, I brought in cameras, I brought in videotape, I, I brought in professional videographer, and, and I think that it generated negative results in retrospect. I, mm-hmm. I think that was the case, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I gather that it, at some point, Richards uh, adopted the position that if you cheat a little bit and get people to uh, enter into a state of awe, like a miracle just occurred, that that's psi conducive, that facilitates an authentic phenomena. Well, he had been in correspondence with Bachelor He and Bachelor wrote regularly, and I also wrote to Bachelor a number of times, because we were, we were all puzzled by the phenomena. And Bachelor also wrote to this uh, a researcher in Germany, Walter Lukadal, and uh, everyone was kind of putting their heads together. And Bachelor had this idea uh, that. Uh, pushing the table around would facilitate the phenomena. And Richards agreed with that. Uh, uh, but I think from my interaction with Richards, that he was not a, he, I, I don't think he thought he was pushing the table around. Mm. And my, imp- now here's the problem that I have, perhaps. My impression and the other Surratt's impression is that he wasn't pushing the table around because when we put our hands on the table it had a kind of vibration to it which was it seemed paranormal it was a very rapid vibration and and none of us could duplicate it it would if a person were duplicating that they had some kind of a very very special uh muscular skill of some mm-hmm. sort and so oftentimes it had this vibration to it and it, it would not happen unless Richards put his hand on it. Okay, I never saw it happen unless... And same with John Hunt. That was also his observation. But there were occasions where Richards took his hand off the table and it would still vibrate like that. And there were occasions where I was the only one who had my hand on the table and it was vibrating like that. And I certainly feel confident I wasn't pushing it around. In fact, most of all the videotapes show the table sliding underneath my fingers during the sessions. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so there's that problem. Yeah. Uh, so, but, and, and, and Richards in his conversations with me always claimed that he never cheated, that he had not cheated at all. So I think if he did engage in some kind of fraud it's on some kind of subconscious level and in his early interaction with the Surrats, he sometimes went into trance. A lot of the Surrats did. And spirits would speak through him. Now, he, I think uh, the notes indicate that his last time was in the early 1980s. So he went through most of his life not just falling into trance spontaneously. But it could be. And, and also, when I began this letter-writing phenomena, I realized that this created a pocket of ambiguity, and that would be the kind of thing that the entities like. They like ambiguity, and so we we'll just have to, yeah, just have to live with that, and and you know, let it be. Yeah. You know? One of the most interesting features of your book is is that at the end you have uh, comments from a wide. A variety of observers of the phenomenon, hardcore skeptics and true believers and researchers. And uh, uh, some of those comments I found very interesting. Uh, one person, I believe it was Dennis Stillings, uh, commented he thought the phenomena was real, but the purpose of it, he thought, seemed to be to ruin the lives of all the participants. Well, yes. Uh, and... Uh... There, there is that. That seems to be a part of spiritual, the spiritual phenomena. In other words, uh, I think there's probably a lot of people who are listening to us right now who have found that they spontaneously experience extrasensory perception or out-of-body experience or uh, uh, precognition or, or, you know, PK, psychokinesis. And it's not something that they want to have happen. It's not something they're really inviting to have happen. But it's as if they've been chosen to manifest this phenomena. And it, it may have, 
it can have negative implications. It can be a problem. And, and I think the, the nature of shamanism, the nature of shamanism and of many different religions is, is to kind of channel this in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's what I would, I think I tried to do that with my own life, uh, figure out how to channel this in a positive direction. And then you can go somewhere and it's, and it makes sense from that vantage point. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you, if you, if you cannot figure out a spiritual discipline or a spiritual path to follow, then you're stumbling in the darkness and it can have a negative effects. And Stillings wasn't seeking any kind of spiritual enlightenment or anything like that. And so from his vantage point, he, he, he pointed out to me that the Richards had experienced a lot of medical problems and things were going wrong. But this was in 1983. He lived for many, many years after that, afterwards. And he, he was psychologically a stable person. So was he, he and his wife had a very, very stable marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why they were so successful. They, they were very successful as a group, just the two of them, and had very, very powerful experiences just together uh, doing table tipping mm -hmm. sessions. And, and you yourself witnessed all kinds of uh, rappings and, and other phenomenon in their presence. Yes, wraps, uh, table movements, a table balancing on two legs. Uh, uh, but I, let's see, I don't know how to frame this. Uh, my, uh, you know, year, the years go by, and I, I think uh, the Asian, I, I spent a lot of time in Asia, and there's a lot of Asian traditions which look at psychic phenomena as a, it's a real phenomena, but it's kind of a, a marker of a path, of a spiritual path, and, and you shouldn't become too attached to the phenomena. You just take note of it and move on. Mm -hmm. and, and Richards himself was like that. The idea was to develop the rapport. We, we don't, we're not really coming to see the phenomena. We're coming to develop rapport and through that to raise your spiritual level and to, to gain a kind of sense of selflessness. And, and so I think that's the, there's kind of a universal pathway that people can follow. All the, all the, all church steeples point to heaven, you might say. Yeah. Well, it, and when you use the word rapport, uh, it sounds very close to love, uh, which I gather was also frequently mentioned by the spirits. Well, they were, uh, a lot of the spirit's philosophy seemed to be uh, uh, originating or an offspring of Nyhart's philosophy. And Nyhart uh, coined the phrase pragmatic mysticism. In other words, there's a kind of down-to-earthness about this. So, yes, we should love one another, but it's pretty difficult. So uh, perhaps the people around you... you Maybe you should start off with them, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, creating harmony in the environment around yourself and, uh, and not having, a, you know, nebulous uh, pie in the sky visions of, of, or explanations of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose, in a sense, being able to come together with a group of people and produce psychokinetic uh, appearing phenomenon is, is a way of... Uh, demonstrating that you're achieving a level of rapport. Well, it would seem so, but uh, now here's the other problem that I have. I'm a sociologist, and I, I believe in social science, and I believe in the scientific method. So I hung out with these people for decades, and in the 1980s, Ed Cox, that group that I was interacting with, there are many, many times where there wasn't particularly high levels of rapport and people didn't agree about the nature of the phenomena. And yet it's, it still occurred hmm. and in, uh, for my observation of shamanism. Oftentimes there's kind of like a, an audience call phenomena. Notice the, the shamans has a belief and the other people are just gathering around and they're seeking their own, you know, self, fulfillment or something like that and so it's not that easy to to develop rapport within groups and and i've i've tried organizing table tipping groups and, and haven't been successful on my own hmm. uh, people 
want the phenomena to occur. They want to, they want the, the high and the rush, but they're they're not that interested in really developing rapport. Mm-hmm. It, 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 the, the original, I've, the original Surats have talked to me about there was a very high level of rapport in those early days, and it, it was somehow connected with the high spirited college student phenomena. And then at, at the end of Richard's life, his son Ivan organized a group which was very successful Mm -hmm. and it seemed like they uh, replicated the er earlier phenomena with college students younger college students Mm -hmm. so uh, when people have a their their minds are rigid and they're they have fixed ideas about how things are going to work gathering a bunch of people together like that may not be so successful are there surat groups uh, functioning these days no, there's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ivan died uh, in 2017, and his friends are are dispersed. Now, there's old there's SRAT members, and I, I just interviewed some of them recently, and uh, their memories are fresh. But I, I suspect that there's people listening to this program who have, uh, have active table-tipping experiences, and it wouldn't be too hard if a bunch of them got together. I, I suspect they could produce the phenomena. It's, Bachelor Door, when I when I corresponded with him, he told me that it's really easy to produce. Now that wasn't my experience, but I was this social scientist and a skeptical person, and yeah. so if if I attend such a group, I'll just keep my mouth shut, you know. <laughs> and and I think. Uh, I had some unusual experiences in the psychiatric hospital, which I think fall in the category of spiritual healing. And so I'm on the pathway, I I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. James McLennan, what a pleasure to discuss this research. It's a uh, very significant, in my opinion. And uh, obviously, it's still controversial, but uh, uh, I appreciate the fact that you're really looking at it in in great depth and from the perspective of many decades of involvement. Well, and I appreciate what you're doing, too. I think this is, uh, we're all on this pathway, and uh, it's good for us to share our experiences with each other. And I look forward to future conversations uh, with you about some of your other uh, research projects and your sociological observations. So thank you very much for being with me. Yeah, thank you. And I hope that some of the people listening, if they have questions, or we might address some of those issues too. Yeah, so post comments and uh, we'll think about addressing them in a future program. 